I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. We're so happy to have all of you uh, joining us today. Um, or tonight, I should say, um, for uh, our, our broadcast and our very special guest, Dr. Kyle Hogarth, who's the professor of medicine in the section of pulmonology and critical care medicine at the University of Chicago. However, he will be joining us tonight from his uh, vacation in Wyoming. I'm going to ask Dr. Hogarth before we jump into tonight's topic, which is pulmonology and um, managing multiple lung nodules, um, to Give us a, a quick hello and tell us who he is and uh, why lung cancer is important to him. So I run the bronchoscopy <laughs> program at University of Chicago and have obviously been working in this field for some time. And lung cancer is the reason I get up in the morning. It's the reason why I'm, I'm here on a trip with my family and I'm on this call because um, the fight never ends and it's unbelievably important to me. Before we jump into the discussion about managing lung nodules and then move on to pulmonology as a whole, um, I want to do a little bit of explaining to the folks who may be watching about what exactly lung nodules are. Um, I know um, I've, I've, I've read and learned along the way that, you know, by the age of 50, um, you know, around 50% of adults um, will, will have lung nodules and that a large majority, upwards of 95% of those are not cancerous. So um, can we talk a little bit about what a lung nodule is? Um, uh, some of the features, um, and so on, starting, you know, with, uh, well, let's, let's just jump into what a, what, what a lung nodule is, and then I can ask questions along the way. It's a radiologic description. So on a CAT scan, someone will, um, uh, there's, there's sort of the, the broad spectrum of black and white. So air, what the lung is, will show up black on a CAT scan. Things like that are bone will be bright white, and then the various grays in between represent all the other tissues. Your lung should just basically be, at least on a CAT scan, mostly air and some blood vessels. And that's what we expect to see when we do a normal CT scan on somebody. When we see something in that space that shouldn't be there, it is then characterized as a nodule. Um, if it's under the size of three centimeters, if it's bigger than that, it actually gets called a mass. Um, but it, it represents something solid. And of course, a nodule can be many things. That's where everyone's concerns begin, because of course, a nodule could be cancer. But like you said, the majority of nodules that we find on the general population, and even a high-risk population, if they are small, they generally are not cancer. Distinguishing, of course, between the two is the question, right? Right? And that's a lot of what I do, and, and many people like myself spend a lot of time doing, um, deciding on what's the best course with our patients together um, to help sort out what these things are. The problem is your lung scars, like everything else. So, you know, if you uh, the best way I can describe it, if you got a cut, you know, you have, you have a little wound on your arm and it was deep enough, let's say you got stitches, you have a scar there for forever, right? Well, your lung will scar similarly from infections and other things that have insulted the lung, if you will, and it leaves a mark. But the problem is, is it's not always easy to tell one from the other. And so a lot of times that's all a nodule is, is a scar. 
when we are looking at lung nodules, there are different features. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those features are, margins, density, size, consistency? I know a lot of times patients, um, especially those patients that are very active um, in their healthcare, will receive copies of their CAT scan reports and it will explain things like, or say things like spiculated, ground glass. Can you explain a little bit what, what some of these differences are in nodules? So you're, you're always going to start with its size. Um, and you're going to start also with, so is it smooth and round, you know, like a marble? Um, or is it, uh, when you say the word spiculated, that's where it looks um, almost like a starburst and there's sort of pointed rays coming off of it. Um, you will describe whether there's calcium in it or not. You'll describe its density. Each of these various characteristics raise and lower the probability of cancer. And so ultimately when it comes to a nod, there are no absolute. It is a larger spiculated nodule, for example, very concerning for cancer, but not a guarantee that it's a cancer. It's always about probabilities of malignancy that raise or lower our concerns with our patients. You've talked a little bit about some of the features. The margins are either spiculated, you know, with the pointy sort of edges, smooth, you know, more like a like a like a softball, I guess, or lobulated with more sort of cloud-like, you know, sort of shaped edges. Um, you talked about right. density, size, consistency, um, a little bit whether they're solid or partially solid or ground glass. So what? And and you mentioned that you know there are some things you look for that may sort of lend itself towards being more suspicious, but most definitely does not always mean that it's a malignancy. What are some of those things that might make it look more suspicious or need further um, evaluation? Size, uh, bigger, always more concerning. The speculation is like you talked about. Um, mm -hmm. Also the patient's history. So if there is a prior cancer history that you were always a little more worried, as, you know, that's cancer anywhere, is a nodule we already said, you know, it doesn't have to be cancer, but even if it is malignant, it doesn't have to be lung cancer, although that's obviously always our concern and focus. Um, sure. And so it could be a cancer from someplace else. And so size and the speculations are probably the two biggest things put in again with that person's history, um, their smoking history, though, of course, clearly non-smokers are at risk as well, um, their family history, um, and then Additional tests that can sometimes help, so things like a PET scan, though a PET scan is in no way, shape, or form definitive for cancer either, because things that are inflammatory will be positive on a PET scan. The, the way that I've heard this best described, a, a colleague of mine, Doug Ehrenberg at Michigan, describes it as a, a sort of a dial, uh, and how more concerned or less concerned am I, you know, when I look at a nodule. You know, if someone tells me, hey, I have this CAT scan, and there's a a nodule on it, but then they're able to pull up a, an image from like say a year ago where they had another CAT scan for whatever reason and we can see it and in one year it has not changed at all, I'm a lot less worried. Not, not zero worried, but less worried. If it has gotten bigger over a period of time, again, now I'm more worried. Not definitive, but going to influence the discussion I have with you. And, and like I said, the reason I'm glad to do things like this and, and for any patient on the line, um, you have to definitely ask probative questions and ask important ones like, what's the probability that this is malignant or not? What do I need to do up or down to be concerned? So that kind of lends or leads into the uh, sort of the, the, the management part of it and, and also what happens next if you see something suspicious. And you already, you talked a little bit about the sort of watch and wait, like, well, I'm, wherever you are on that dial, if you're below the, the five, if it's a one to 10 dial, right? Maybe it's a watch and wait to see what happens right. next. At what point does it take that next step and move on from something suspicious to something that mm, maybe we need to look a, a, a little deeper at and, and grab a biopsy? You know, I would argue, I guess it's a moving target. And the reason I say that is that it's Partly the, the physician in their, their sense of what the risk is for this nodule being malignant. Part of it's clearly the patient. Um, we all have to have a, a frank discussion of what's the chance it's cancer versus also when I have to start doing invasive procedures of any kind, those come at you know risk of pain and suffering and, God forbid, complications. Um, right. it, so it's a discussion, right? And so I can tell you, you know, hey, there's only a 2% chance it's cancer. Now, 
to me, that's worth taking at least a short-term follow-up. And I think what everyone needs to understand is someone says, hey, we're, quote, watch and wait. That doesn't actually mean we're doing nothing. That means, instead, we're actually trying to protect you from people like me. <laughs> in other words, I'll be glad to put scopes inside you and poke and prod at you, but why would I do that if the chance of cancer is so low, I'm, you know, jokingly trying you from me. But if I instead say to you, look, you know, there's about a 20% chance this is cancer. Well, some people, you know, maybe with that, me as your advising physician, I'm not comfortable with those odds. Um, I, I want to know if it is or not. Now, look, there's other things that weigh into this because depending on what procedure is going to be offered or what procedures are available, you may not be able to have a less invasive procedure or maybe you have multiple other medical conditions that make this 20% chance not, you know, it, none of us like it, but maybe doing a procedure on you is dangerous because of your heart condition or, or whatever. The problem I think that everyone always faced in nodule management in general is that there really isn't a one size fall. And as, as unique as every single person on this, you know, conference is, that's the uniqueness on the approach as well. And that that's why you always want to be being evaluated by somebody who does this for a living, who focuses on lung nodules, lung nodule management, lung cancer management, like taking biopsies of the lung. It's not someone who is a dabbler, but someone who does it full time. Quite often, when patients do get, you know, a CT scan or, you know, pulmonary nodules are found incidentally. In other words, they, God forbid, got in a car accident and had a CT scan and all of a sudden, you know, everything looks great. You don't have a broken back, but we, we spotted some of these nodules. And it's not always just one nodule. So when we're talking about multiple I have, I have, nodules. Yeah, I have two. Yeah. Oh, I have two. Do you? Me. I have two nodules. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cat scan yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. So when you are looking at these multiple nodules and you talk about management of these nodules, what does it what does that mean? Multiple nodules is a is a broader thought process in that definitely someone could have two different cancers developing. Let's say that let's start with find the word multiple. Let's say there's just two nodules. Okay, well that could be two separate lung cancers developing. That's one possibility. It could be a lung cancer that has spread within the lung to another part of the lung. That's another possibility. It could be multiple scars. Mine are scars, 100% um, scars, because I got follow-up scans and showed they didn't grow. So for as an example, um, and I can tell you where they from. I had pneumonia. There they are. So, um, but there are other diseases. Um, the rheumatologic diseases can lead to nodules in the lungs. I think always... The first take-home message, you said it at the beginning, is that a majority of lung nodules found are not cancerous. And that's a good place to start every conversation. That doesn't mean we're not worried about our patients. That doesn't mean we're ignoring your concerns. But at the beginning, what we're always starting with is, thankfully, a majority of nodules found are not cancerous. And, and you know, let's explore what they could be. Depending on where you live, there are a lot of fungal infections that look just like a cancer. Um, in my neck of the woods, we have a lot of histoplasmosis and blastomycosis. And we have a lot of patients that go to the Southwest and then pick up coccidiomycosis. They present pet positive spiculated nodules. They look just like a lung cancer. You just want to make sure it's not that. And, and the only way, I guess, to determine that would be to bi biopsy? This is where the other great advances that have been going on. So the other bit of good news for a lot of our patients, besides all the advances in CAT scans and better ability to be inside the body, and of course, way better therapies if you know someone does need therapy for cancer, there are several blood-based tests that can help to risk stratify, not just based on your CAT scan, but also based on how your body is responding to what's going on inside. In other words, there, if that is a cancer, there's a sort of signal, if you will, that your body is giving off, and we can start to measure that. If it's something infectious, there's a different signal that he's giving off. And these tests aren't perfect, but they raise and lower that risk, that needle. That newer technology, this one blood test has only been available for less than a year. There's also blood tests to look for your body making antibodies to these various infections. And so there's a lot of other things that we have at Ozil that we do long before we start talking about taking biopsies to figure things out.
So you talk about these, this blood-based, you know, risk stratification test. I mean, is that something that um, is done on all patients? And if it's not, is it something patients should be having conversations with their physicians about um, yes. during this process? So it's, it's, a relatively, it's a relatively new test, and there's, and there's many others under development. And so there's a, thankfully going to be a selection of choices, if you will. It's a blood draw. So there are, of course, various exclusions. If you've had a prior cancer history, these tests have not been validated. So they, they, they are done in someone who has a lung nodule that is indeterminate. We don't know what it is, but does not have a cancer history. And they're not perfect because they don't say 100%. They don't say 0%. And in some cases, there isn't enough of a signal. And they say they don't really change the risk. What, what, I, what I always warn all my patients about is that, you know, let's say you come to see me and I say to you, you know, there's a 6% chance it's cancer. I think we should get a follow-up scan. We should not do a biopsy. And you go see another doctor and he'll say the same thing. And then you'll go see someone else and she'll say the same thing. But if you keep looking, you will find someone willing to operate on you at some point. And then of course they will have proved it was benign. You will have gone through an unnecessary surgical procedure you know, if you hunt long and hard, you will find someone willing to, you know, do a procedure that you don't need. So just be cautious, you know, and again, watch and wait. It does not mean goodbye, never see you again. It, and quite honestly, frequently, a majority of the time when we get a follow-up scan, it's three months after the original scan. But depending on when the patient's scan was done, and then they see their doctor and their doctor sends them to another doctor, that scan already may be a month old. And so, you know, waiting an additional two months the, the, even if it's a cancer, for these small nodules, their rate of growth and their risk of spread is so low that we are not harming you in the off chance it's a cancer. But what we are doing is protecting you from unnecessary procedures. And that's what these blood tests do as well. One of the things that, you know, to me seems like such a shame is quite often when patients are told you know, that they've, that a nodule has been found, this type of conversation hasn't happened with their physician in order to help to sort of quell their fears, right? So I go get a CT scan, somebody tells me they see something in, you know, one of my lobes that's not supposed to be there, come back in three months, end of story, I'm going home and panicking. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, So what would you recommend maybe patients whose, whose physicians aren't having that conversation, how do they sort of start that conversation? And so what questions should they be asking their physician to help sort of quell those fears? Let's, let's start with some of the basics. Um, they should, um, one, if ask their physician, you know, are you a specialist in this area? So like if, if, if it's your general practitioner, they're not a specialist not. in lung nodules and lung cancer. They are, they are um, just following a set of guidelines. But, but you know what? Those guidelines, the various guidelines that have been written to help guide physicians in this decision tree were developed precisely so that we don't take people for both unnecessary uh, procedures, but also unnecessary repetitive scans, right? We used to scan people every two to three months. And for some nodules that are so small, the guidelines tell you not to even be scanned for another year. That was not some arbitrary decision that came out through good research and what that also does then for patients is helps you to avoid getting four to eight CT scans. That's a lot of radiation. You may, you may not have any lung cancer, but if I CT scan you enough, I could give you one, God forbid, right? And mm-hmm. so part of this um, discussion, I think, is, is you as a patient to say, why are you telling me three months? Like, what's your basis of that decision? And they'll say, well, look, there's these online nodule calculators. We plugged in the characteristics of you and your nodule, and it shows us it's a 2% chance it's cancer. 2%, that's not, you can't, you know, too small to biopsy, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we're going to follow it. That's not a very long conversation, but it's a conversation. And and you as the consumer should have that conversation. And if your physician's not willing, find a specialist in lung nodules. It typically are a pulmonologist and have a discussion with them about this. And those are the phone calls we get. How worried should I be? Because, you know, maybe their physician didn't didn't have that conversation with them for for whatever reason. So, really well, great. Let me, and I'll give you I'll give you an example. Let's assume that it comes back as a relatively low risk, and we do watch and wait. And on the follow up scan, 
it grows another two or three millimeters, let's say. Now, the risk for cancer just went up, but still not to 100% because benign things grow as well. But, you know, now we're, we're both worried. I'm more worried. You're more worried. But the good news is, God forbid that's cancer. It was stage one when I met you, and it's still stage one three months later. We've not lost anything as far as helping you. But what we've gained is all the people who avoided unnecessary procedures. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, that those that that three month time frame, you know, could be a win in that it just stays stable and it's nothing really to worry about. But even if right. it does grow a little right. bit, you're still you're not any. I, I hate to use the term worse off, but any worse off than you were three months three months prior to that. No, I mean, it, the, but that, that is the right term to use. I mean, it, it, I understand it's it's nobody wants to have that diagnosis ever, and I think right. we should make one real clear point for all our listeners. We're talking about a CT scan that the only thing present is a lung nodule. That is different than if your CAT scan report says a lung nodule and also one of the lymph nodes in the middle of your chest is enlarged. That is never a watch and wait. If there's an enlarged lymph node, that needs to be biopsied, and it needs to be biopsied right away. We do not watch and wait lymph nodes, and let, I mean, with some rare exceptions. But if someone tells me there's a nodule and a lymph node, that lymph node needs a biopsy and it needs it soon. So this is all people whose CT reports, CT reports only say nodule. Gotcha. So it would not, gotcha. But the, 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 the CT reports, if it had a, 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 any lymph node involvement, it would also say that on the report. It would. Correct. What happened is they would yeah. say there's a nodule X, you know, whatever size and whatever lobe, and the, you know, the whichever side the nodule is on, that hyalur lymph node is enlarged at, you know, 14 millimeters, let's say. Yeah. Well, yeah. that lymph node should not be enlarged. And yeah. if it's enlarged, it doesn't, of course. So I just want to clarify because that's a completely different discussion. That's yeah. not a discussion yeah. of a nodule anymore. That's a discussion of an enlarged lymph node. But that's important because. A lot of times people only talk about the, the nodule, but when you read in the report, they talk about enlarged lymph nodes, that needs to always be evaluated. Yeah, and patients you know, that don't probably should um, hang on to these, these reports. Um, um, Definitely. I have a question. Does it matter whether or not the same machine, for example, is being used for that patient's PET scan or CT scan? Are they calibrated differently? Is it important? It's a great question. Um, it's not so much the same machine. There's, there are subtle differences between brands, if you will. You know, the the one place may have a certain brand, but there but there are profound differences in how a CT scan is processed, and that has nothing to do with the brand of the scanner. That has to do with the protocols that are used by the radiologist in that radiology center. So frequently what happens at my own institution, and, and the, the guidelines are that everybody's CT scan of their chest should be essentially a one millimeter slice thickness. So that means that's, that's high resolution, one millimeter or less, and continuously sliced. What, what many people don't know is that you'll get a CAT scan at a center that uses what are called three millimeter cuts, and those are thicker. But the, that three millimeter cut is a lot of averaging. And depending on where the next scan is done, a nodule that was only you know, a few millimeters because it cut across you know, two of these three millimeter cuts, the patient's, it's ever so slightly different, but now it shows up on three separate cuts. And so now the radiologist officially has to call it bigger, but it's actually not bigger. Um, and so, because it's just the yardstick you're using, if you will. So. One of the very important things is, if, is to try to be consistent with where you get your scans. So not necessarily the scanner, but the center, so that you're truly comparing apples to apples. But again, if you get that incidental scan found, and you know they were scanning your abdomen for kidney stones and they find a nodule in your chest, when you go to get that follow-up scan that's going to be dedicated to your chest, you want to get it at a center that, again, has experience with lung nodules. You're going to get the same radiation. Actually, you're going to get less because the better scanners do the thinner cuts, but they do it with less radiation. So you're going to get less radiation and quite literally get more bang for your buck. And you're going to get more data for the, you and the physician to truly quantify your cancer risk, which is 
the only reason you're here. And there's there's still centers that do five millimeter cuts. That's like honestly looking at the television you used to have 30 years ago and comparing it to the one that you're probably looking at right now. I mean, obviously this is a well-known thing. Is that something that's taken into consideration when repeat scans are, are um, when appointments are being made for these repeat scans or is it something that maybe just kind of- I wish, it's, it's, it has to do yeah. honestly, it's, it's protocol driven and it's driven by the radiologist. So years and so the original Fleischer Society guidelines were written by our thoracic chief of radiology. And what it meant when we started switching our protocol over a decade ago was that they had over 300 images to look at. And that's a lot of work for the radiologist. The, the quote industry standard was to look at 90. So they were quadrupling their work and yeah. they did it because they knew it was better for the patients. But, but sadly, that's not what everybody does. And yeah. again, that's, you know, I, I, I have this conversation frequently with my parents who live nowhere near any major cities. And they'll say, well, I'll just go to this place down the street. It's so convenient. And I, I've, I've seen the place down the street. It may be convenient, but that doesn't mean it's providing good care. And yeah. so when it comes to something as important as may I have lung cancer or not, um, go to a place that has experience with lung nodules and was going to do your CAT scan correctly. It's yeah. worth the extra drive. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I know that there, to your point about your folks and where they live, I and mean, there's a lot of people in this country that live in more rural areas, right? I mean, there's a ton of, there's a ton of disparities and, and, and socioeconomic issues. I mean, you name it, right? That, that may not, you know, readily allow a education on this topic or b um for it to be easy for a patient to access this good quality care um but you know i know that at, at go to foundation we've got um sites around the country that we work with um so we fortunately are able to help a lot of folks get to these these quality centers and so that everybody's aware it's you don't have to always be in a big city there are some very yeah. excellent centers in very small towns there's yeah. wide variability and you know, it's, it's, you know, this is, this is the foundation for lung cancer, but um, every nodule has that potential to be that. So if you've got friends and families that have been told they've had an abnormal CT scan, this is definitively the starting point for you from a resource perspective. Mm -hmm. So a question about, we talked about, um, you know, multiple nodules, maybe one is cancerous, one isn't, maybe there are two different cancers. If you're looking at, you know, like I said, multiple nodules on a, on a CT scan, does this same sort of thought process apply for a patient who maybe has been living with lung cancer for the last four or five years and then, um, you know, a new nodule pops up? Is that still a, um, if it's very small, doesn't look super suspicious, are you still managing it the same way or are you leaning more towards it being some sort of metastatic disease? So, mm -hmm. you know, we'll take a, a, a lung cancer survivor who had surgery, cured, free of disease, active surveillance, and then suddenly a new nodule pops up, you know, four years mm -hmm. after. Obviously, mm -hmm. everyone is terrified, patient first and everybody else, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a seven millimeter nodule. And it wasn't there a year ago, because let's say they're, they're far enough out that they're not getting scanned every, you know, three months. So a seven millimeter nodule, and a lot of the, you know, some of the tests I was talking about, those are, are not validated. You're, they're not validated in a cancer survivor. But when you still plug in just generally, what's the risk of this? You look again, what's the nodule size? What are the nodule's characteristics? We're going to do a short-term follow-up scan if it's that small, for example. Because even in that patient, the further you get out from your you know, first diagnosis of cancer and then undergo you know, a, a curative intent resection, for example, um, the, once you're two years out from that surgery, your probability of malignancy goes down a lot, thank goodness. Um, and so another nodule shows up. Yes, we're worried, but nor should we go charging in and start cutting out a significant amount of lung. We get a short-term follow-up scan if the nodule's small. Now, it's been a year since we scanned you and you have something fairly large. Um, we're gonna have a discussion, right? I think what also ends up framing a lot of these discussions is what's the level of invasiveness we're gonna have to do in order to tease out what this is, right? If this is a nodule that we can easily get to with one of our uh, bronchoscopy devices, well, that's minimally invasive. 
straightforward, we'll figure out what this is and put the issue to rest one way or the other. Yeah. Well, that's very beneficial for the patient. But if they're fa fairly small, our ability to successfully biopsy them is actually quite limited. And honestly, the super small ones should be watched because even in a high-risk patient, majority of these are still going to not be malignant. Interesting. I know with um, th some of you watching may or may not know, um, if depending upon how new you are to the living room, that Bonnie Adario, uh, co-founder and chair of GoTo, is my mom. And I know she was diagnosed in 2003. Um, and so she's obviously, you know, 17 years out from, um, from her original stage 3B diagnosis. Um, but she has nodules. She still gets scanned. Um, you know, annually, and she has nodules that they've been watching for, you know, a better part of a decade now. Um, so um, that's just one example of, of, of kind of what we're, we're talking about. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about your role um, on a multidisciplinary team, you know, specific to a, to a lung cancer patient, because I think quite often patients, you know, in treatment for, for lung cancer don't have a pulmonologist that they see on a regular basis and on their team. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important and what role you play in the ongoing sure. um, treatment of a, of a lung cancer patient? Uh, absolutely. So it, under, understandably, if you've been diagnosed with lung cancer at whatever stage, it becomes an all-consuming process. But what I often, unfortunately, frequently see, the rest of your body doesn't like go on pause. So your blood pressure still needs to be controlled, for example. If you have underlying COPD, we need to be treating that because the last thing I want you to do is get a pneumonia or an exacerbation. That's only going to make things worse while you're going through on your journey with lung cancer. You know, it, it's easy to lose focus on everything else. Understandably, lung cancer becomes the focus, but it actually does you well to have another member of your team who's not the person in charge of, you know, chemotherapies or, you know, immunotherapies. I, I don't prescribe those things. I'm in charge right. of your lungs. I'm the person who's right. there to help make sure you're breathing well. And your internist right. is there to make sure that, by the way, that you, you know, haven't been screened for colon cancer in two years, five years, whatever. We don't want to go through everything you're going to be going through and then to have something sneak up on us that we could have nipped in the bud from the beginning. Um, there are, of course, you know, for all the great advances we've had, there are, of course, side effects and complications with the various interventions and drugs. You, you need to talk to, you know, the radiation oncologist or your oncologist. But if it's affecting your breathing, your pulmonologist is involved. If you had a surgery and there's issues with your wound, your surgeon needs to be involved. And that is the whole idea of the multidisciplinary team. You know, when it comes to lung cancer and lung cancer survival, it does indeed take a village, and that village is all the specialties that are involved in lung cancer. Everybody needs to be at that table, even if you're not always physically seeing them. What I always tell all my patients, when I make a lung cancer diagnosis and say, okay, tumor board you know, meets in three days, and, and basically, even though you're not going to physically see everybody, everyone's going to see you, you know, virtually, if you will, and review everything. And we're going to come up with the best possible plan with everyone's input as to how we're going to help you beat this. And, and, and that's the only way to move forward. You, patients absolutely have to be cared for by a multidisciplinary team. I could, I could not agree more. And I think I remember um, this early, you know, even though it was back in 2003 and, and 2004, really when, when my mom's treatment started, um, she had a pulmonologist who was, played a very active role um, throughout the process. And it just, it was shocking to me to, to find as I began to work in this space that people, people didn't and things like pulmonary function tests, right. To see where, where you are and is that changing over the course of your treatment and what type of support might a patient need based on what their pulmonary function looks like. And I think one of the ones that's quite often missed, um, and, and I think is a really important one and will continue to be, especially as screening becomes uh, m m more prevalent and folks are having, you know, lobes removed or, or surgeries because their surgery was found early stage, um, it, there, that, that will have a direct effect on your pulmonary function and what it looks like because you're now short a lobe, Absolutely. right? Um, but one of the things I found really interesting, and we unfortunately didn't find it out with my mom until we were in a situation that it became relative, relevant, and that was an altitude test to determine how her lungs function at certain altitudes. And 
you know, whether it be her home in Tahoe that sits about 6,000 feet, or quite honestly, even for those who don't think that altitude's an issue, but maybe traveling long distance on airplanes, need to know that planes are pressurized at between six and 8,000 feet. So if you have trouble breathing at that altitude, it's important that you know that as you get on a plane, right? It's all the little things. It's the, you know, it, it, you need somebody, you need your internist and you need your pulmonologist for the two people that are still very much on your side, but are not there battling cancer directly. Because again, I don't prescribe any of these drugs. I'm there right. battling for the rest of you, right? right? And I think that goes right. in hand. The other reason to have this multidisciplinary team you know, if you are found to be an early stage cancer, but let's say you have some various comorbid conditions, heart disease, lung disease, et cetera, very frequently people are told they're not a surgical candidate. Um, get a second opinion by a person who only does thoracic surgery. There are general surgeons who do not, should not be anywhere near your chest uh, on the inside, and yet frequently that is still the case. And then there are cardiothoracic surgeons who spend 90% of their time working on hearts and 10% of their time working on lungs. And then there are dedicated thoracic surgeons who have had extra training only and solely dealing with lungs and lung cancer. And as you can imagine, patients' outcomes are very much tied to that level of experience. You, you, I, am, I am fortunate and blessed. I, I work with three thoracic surgeons who are spectacular. Uh, I, it's, it, I, I have... You know, if they ever tell my patients they're not able to have an operation, there's not even a debate. Then it unfortunately means they're not able to have an operation because if these yeah. folks can't do it, no one can. And it's, yeah. that's, and that's there. And thankfully, there are people like this all over the country. Is there anything else that you want to touch on or focus on um, or that you think is really important for the folks watching um, to know before we uh, sign off and, and close out? Remember when you've been told you have a nodule, um, start off with the fact that though cancer's on the list, it is not a guarantee that that's what it is. So take a deep breath and be thorough in, in your approach to it. Um, it's understandably that the first reaction is panic. That's what mine was. I got told I had two nodules. My brain went right to the lung cancer picture. And then I paused, reviewed my scan, and took a deep breath and realized what the chances were, et cetera, and had a thoughtful approach you know, with a colleague who managed me to make sure it was fine and avoided unnecessary procedures. If you're going to need a procedure, make sure that it's been justified as to why you need it. What is the probability that this is malignant? What's the probability that the procedure is going to be diagnostic? What is the probability of complications from that procedure? Are there non-invasive means to figure that out through blood tests, etc.? Be an active consumer so that before you're laying on any form of a table to have a bronchoscopy or a needle biopsy or a surgery, that you have a complete understanding as to why you're there laying on that table having that procedure. And if you can't tell me why you're laying there, then your physician has not done a good job of explaining to you the real risk for this to be malignant and what we're trying to accomplish today. You talked a little bit about, you know, maybe you have a, a single pulmonary nodule, but also a lymph node. This uh, person is asking about a uh, nodule or nodules on, on both sides. So if it crosses yeah. over the mediastinum, what does that, what does that look like? Well, so if there's two nodules and they're on, you know, in both lungs, um, there's, it's the same still possibility that each one is an individual lung cancer. One's a lung cancer, one's not, or it's a lung cancer that is spread to the other side. Um, and all of those clearly mean very, very different things. Um, what ends up happening, um, it, the each individual nodule, so if you have had no history and you've been told you have two nodules, then we assess the risk of each nodule based on your, the individual characteristics of that nodule. So if one's, you know, six millimeters, very low risk, right? The other is 1.4 centimeters, higher concern, and it's speculated, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The 1.4 one, you and I are going to have a discussion about doing a biopsy. The six millimeter one, we're going to follow that. So we're going to have a procedure on the one, watch and wait on the other. Great. Right. Um, so another question, uh, well, you talked a little bit about inflammation. And if, and if a patient's told it's inflammation and to come back in X time um, uh, for, for a repeat CT scan and they're still told inflammation, how long do you look at inflammation for you think, well, maybe it's not inflammation. Right. So, so 
I guess what I would say is it would depend on what they're calling inflammation. And, and what I mean by that is on a CT scan, sometimes the word inflammation is used when in reality what they should be describing is something called a ground glass opacity. Um, now, usually most radiologists can make that distinction pretty clearly. And a persistent ground glass opacity, that's actually a completely different discussion because that's separate from a pulmonary nodule. And there's a different set of guidelines and follow-up for those. And it, I'm sure you've had a living room on this. Um, but if a, a ground glass thing starts to become more solid, that's extremely concerning. That's actually probably one of the most concerning findings of a ground glass density on a follow-up scan becoming more solid, more dense. Um, but when people ask, well, what was, you know, why was there inflammation? So, you know, you have all these little airways. If one of those gets filled with a little bit of mucus, then the area behind it can become inflamed and almost, think of it almost as a mini pneumonia. It's not what it really is, but, but you can frame it in your brain that way. Really tiny, but again, on a CAT scan, it will show up as something solid because the lung should be mostly filled with air. And if it's filled with a little bit of mucus or a little bit of pus, it will look more solid because part of the lung around that will close down. And so the radiologist can only call what they see and they have to describe what they see. Um, I will point out, you, you know, when we talk about describe what they see, so radiologists will use some specific words, but a pulmonologist has to see your scan. So if you come to see your lung doctor with a new CAT scan finding and you've had your scan done at a different hospital, you must bring the actual images. So bring, usually it's on a disc. Um, the, the report is not good enough. We need to visualize and view the nodule. We, we, we look at them differently than our radiology colleagues. It's complementary in the view. So please always, so when you said earlier, keep a report, I will tell you if you've had a CAT scan someplace, get the disc burned. Unfortunately, even with electronic medical records having some level of being able to be shared between some medical centers where, you know, hospital system X can see some of the reports and why, what we can't ever see is the actual images. Those still, sadly, have to be burned onto a CD or a DVD. It's ridiculous, but that's how it is. Dr. Hogarth, I cannot um, thank you enough for taking the time out, um, especially on your family vacation in Wyoming. I hope you have beautiful weather um, <laughs> and enjoy, enjoy the, uh, the rest of your, of your time there. You know, the sign behind you says it all. I mean, there, in this field right now, there is so many advancements going on at all stages and, and even in someone who's got a nodule. You know, it has been such a wonderful journey for people like myself, who when I first entered this field out of training, uh, it was not very great news frequently. And to, on a daily basis, have better things to offer my patients, I mean, it just makes my job easier and easier. And it, I love sharing that with my patients. So thank you wow. for having me. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for uh, everything you do. Oh, I'd be brave if you're brave I'd be brave, but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together and it could be just you and me will be family just wait and see